Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. It is beyond a thrill to be able to introduce one of the four members of the Seekers. Keith Potka, good morning and welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show. Hello, good morning, Rob and Neil as well, yeah? Yes, indeed, you've got that well done, thank you. Oh, it's good to know you know about us as much as we know about you, <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, Keith, it is it is a joy to have uh, have you on, I think anyone in, uh, in Australia at the moment uh, between the ages of us and um, about... Younger people. <laughs> younger people, 35, would had to have been uh, touched at some stage during our, our early years by your music. Uh, sitting back now... At the end of your career, are you able to look back at that and and realise just how much of an influence you have been on the Australian music scene? Well, yeah, the influence, of course, is is uh, in the ears of a beholder, of course. But uh, uh, certainly for us all, and I'm sure I can speak for the rest of the gang as well, is that uh, all those uh, times that we had were, were full of the most gorgeous memories and uh, and great times, and we we had lots of laughs and. Uh, and we're still friends, and uh, uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful relationship. It, it's it's interesting you make that observation, Keith, because I, I watched the uh, very excellent Australian Story um, show about you, I, I, ironically, three weeks ago, completely unaware that we were going to be chatting to you in two or three weeks. And the thing that comes through is we hear of bands that hate each other or they leave each other, you know, the Eagles, you know, when hell freezes over, <laughs> and yet there's a genuine love between the four of you. It comes through. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, we're, we still keep in touch, as I say. And I uh, speaking to Russell yesterday. In fact, and I'll give Jude a call after I've finished speaking with you and tell you how uh, things went. But um, no, it's all it's all really really good, and we're uh, we're still having wonderful times. We we had that uh, that great tour, of course, in uh, 2013 and 2014, when we did uh, uh, the the UK, Australia, and New Zealand, and uh, that was. Uh, in spite of uh, Judith having her brain aneurysm at that time. So, That's right. She was really unwell, wasn't she? Yeah, and she recovered magnificently and was able to to get back on stage and uh, put on the frocks and go for it. And one, one of the reasons we've got you on board today is to talk about that uh, that tour because the, uh, the cleverly named The Seekers Live in the UK <laughs> CD and DVD is out and we will certainly give that a plug. That was the... Uh, the farewell tour there were people i suspect at that stage saying oh yeah we've heard the farewell tour by the seekers before but it, it uh it really was the end of the road it must have just been so such an emotional event for you well it was and the and the audience has certainly made it that for us as well uh they turned out in their thousands and uh, we're very lucky to to uh, have done that tour in all those countries that i just mentioned uh, and really uh, again the memories are fantastic so that was uh, Seven years ago now, mm. we're uh, we're still alive to tell the tale. But uh, it, it it was a it was a wonderful time for us, and and really now with Judith, she doesn't sing anymore, and uh, bless her little heart, she's uh, she's a well uh, person and she's bright and chirpy, and uh, and so that's that's a real bonus. But uh, but no, any any thought of a. Uh, a reunion with the four of us to actually perform again would be uh, would, would be not possible. But um, and we did have our uh, the album that Apple and Bruce and I uh, did together with our musical director Michael Cristiano, which we called the Original Seekers, and uh, that was out a couple of years ago, 2019, and uh, and we did some wonderful concerts there too. And- Keep the pot boiling or simmering, shall we say? Mm-hmm. That's it. Because we go back to early 1960s. Of course, I can't do that, uh, Keith. I'm far too young to go back to the early 1960s. Oh, you said, I can. Winking. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, they, they talk about the day that uh, John Lennon was introduced to Paul McCartney, and that being a significant moment in uh, uh, British music history and music history in general. But the day that you guys met Judith, uh, my understanding was in a coffee lounge in Turak. Well, yes, she came to work at the advertising agency that uh, Apple Guy was an account director of in Melbourne at that time, and uh, she came as a, a, an executive assistant, secretary, whatever you like to call them, and she uh, was already known to us because she'd created a, quite a name for herself in Melbourne at that time, singing with uh, jazz groups, you know, uh, trad, trad jazz groups in Melbourne, and uh, so when she came to uh, the, the, the advertising agency, Apple said, well, how about uh, we've heard of you, and um, how about 
uh, you join us at the at the coffee lounge in uh, Turag Road in uh, in Melbourne and uh, have a bit of a sing along. And she did the poor girl, and so <laughs> getting herself in for. But anyway, uh, several years later, uh, we. Uh, we had a wonderful time. Because uh, to, to talk about the coffee lounge on Turak Road in 2021 would be laughable. There's one or two of them along there now. But in those days, that was quite the thing, wasn't it? Go out and have a, a coffee at a coffee lounge. Very much so, yes. There was no alcohol and, and, and smoking was allowed in all those uh, venues as well. So, you know, we've got some video of the group of <laughs> and the, the haze of cigarette smoke. It was really quite extraordinary. Uh, Keith, we've had the privilege of interviewing a lot of Australian music royalty lately and a lot of them are songwriters and I've always been amazed at how a song comes together. Um, w- when did it start for you to, to start to put music and words together? Uh, did, it, did it start just to entertain yourself and grew from there? Well, yeah, I, it started quite early for me when I was about 17 or 18 years of age, but uh, it didn't really develop properly uh, until I was probably, uh, you know, with the, with the group, I think, uh, I eventually had some of my uh, songs recorded by the Seekers, and, and that was a start. But while I was living in London, I was lucky enough to uh, co-write with some of the great uh, English songwriters, and uh, um, we had some hits there. I uh, co-wrote a couple of hits there, and, and that started the ball rolling. And uh, as it turns out, I'm sitting in my little studio looking at my computer screen because I'm working on a track as we speak. So there you go. Yeah, that, that's a good question because Russell Morris, when asked, "What's your favourite song?" and he said, "The the last one I wrote uh, is is always his favourite song as he creates a new piece." So, are you very much like that? That you're still very passionate about the creativity side of your world? Oh, yeah, very very passionate. And uh, and again, as I said, it's in the ear of the beholder whether whether something um, to use that terrible phrase uh, where it resonates with them. And uh, just leave it up to them. But uh, I, I tootle along doing my stuff and playing my instruments and, uh, and and away you go. You know, just leave it to others to judge. Uh, tell us about the evolution of the new Seekers. You it seemed to be a little uh, uh, baby of yours, so to speak. What what was the, the motivation there uh, at, at that time when we were sort of still thirsting for a bit of what uh, you and uh, your original gang produced, but the New Seekers uh, came along. It was, I remember thinking at the time it was a little odd and it seemed to me to be uh, tapping into greatness. I was, I was a little put off by it. How did it all come about? Well, it came about because uh, the original group, the Seekers, broke up in 1968, July 1968. And I had a business partner in those days, David Joseph, and he and I uh, set about uh, doing some solo work for me and uh, we were uh, thinking of having going on the road with a with a backing band and uh, as we started to work with various musicians to create a, a backing band for me as a solo artist uh, the idea occurred to us that perhaps we should put together a whole new group audition people and, and put together a whole new group and that was how the idea of the new seekers uh, started and so uh, pretty much a year later in 1969 in other words uh, we had put together, auditioned some uh, singers and uh, two girls and, and three boys and put them together and we called them New Seekers. And uh, luckily for us uh, and for them, they, they all went on to have some massive international hits. Uh, and you didn't have to beg, steal and borrow to get any of them, Keith? You do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, that was, that was such a lovely uh, experience for us. And I've got to say, uh, when the New Seekers represented England and the UK in uh, Eurovision in 1972. That was, uh, can you imagine, the lineup of two girls and three boys, all dressed in you know pretty flamboyant gear. And then two years later, who should turn up but ABBA? Two yeah. girls and two boys, all dressed in flamboyant. And I have a funny feeling that uh, that something may have um, may have clicked in Benny and Bjork's uh, mind, and um, and they they decided that uh, ABBA was the way to go. Yeah, it's certainly been. Uh Wonderful to, um, I think Neil's got one of Abba's songs to play later on, one of the new ones, of course. But that that phenomenon hit Australia very much like you were in the 60s. Well, that was my view of it. I, yeah, they may have got a little bit bigger internationally on the back of it, but for for we in Australia, Abba was very much like the Seekers at the height. Do do you um do you sort of agree that, or do you think that might be a, a, a um, too long a bow to draw? 
Oh no, I, th- I think they they just took it to another level because they, they had uh, fantastic production techniques, and of course the, the industry had changed uh, quite a bit by that time, and so it was uh, it was a whole new uh, slate, and they they really uh, wiped the old slate clean and and created their own their own cult, if you like, because uh, now that they've decided to to do another concert, you know, it's like. Um, like the second coming. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with a computer. They look remarkably well for for their age, don't they? <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's why I'm, that's why I'm sitting in front of my computer trying to do things. <laughs> um, it was a it was an oddity at at the time when you came on uh, f- for a band to come together with uh, no no drummer in the band as such, but. Uh, Athel guy with that uh, guitar that was too heavy for him to to lift normally. It it was an oddity. Did you think it was a, a bit of a risk with uh, Athel guy guy playing that um, rather unusual looking double bass? Well, we we kind of grew up through the folk era, and of course, uh, drums were not really a part of uh, a folk or orientated um, a group. It was mainly acoustic instruments. And so that was one of the reasons. In fact, funny enough, when the, when we first started the Seekers, we were four blokes. There was um, Athel, Bruce, myself, and Ken Ray. And at that time, before Athel had taken up the double bass, he was playing the the, the, the side drum. He was playing the uh, the snare drum. And so we did have uh, we did have drums, you know, that, that sort of drums, you know, standing up standing up playing the uh, the, the snare drum. It was an un- it's certainly an unusual look, but it became very much uh, a fun part of the band and another unique piece to it but uh, I, I I do like or your, your style and you use the word folk it was a bit folky and it it fitted in around what was a heavy Beatles Rolling Stones type uh, pop culture at the time so it just sat on the edge of it but for some reason it had a broader appeal and and the best part about it was that you crossed all your um, ages um, that you, you had children really attached to you because of the the joyousness of the music but you also had the older folk um, I can remember how much my parents loved what you produced but they didn't like the Beatles too much but you were able to peel across a wider uh, spectrum yeah we, we did have a very broad uh, demographic that's for sure and it uh, it certainly has benefited us through the years because our fans have been extraordinarily loyal and uh, we've, we've got them to to thank for being able to do those tours that we did because they had sensible haircuts, unlike the Beatles that and the helped. Rolling Stones. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that helped. <laughs> so, and I'm fascinated, Keith. Obviously, if you look at the the work of the Beatles across a similar period to what you were were you know at your peak of your popularity in the UK, they moved from being what I would describe as quite simple songs. You know, you think back to your Love Me Do's and your Please Pleases Me, and then they went through that whole Sergeant Pepper thing where they started to uh, become more creative. Let's use that term, and into the White Album and so forth. Did you feel any pressure to change your style to move along with that sort of move, or were you say, no, no, we've got a sound here and we want to stick with it? Well, we we certainly uh, tried to uh, progress because uh, in 1968 when we released our album that was called Scene in Green uh, we thought that we had uh, gone a, a fair way along the along the path of uh, our harmonies and our instrumentation and things like that uh, but certainly not anywhere near as uh, out there shall we say as as the Beatles or the Stones had, had gone with their with their experimentation and uh, uh, I guess it was it was uh, something that was a comfort zone for us because any of the songs that we did, we all had to agree that that was uh, one of those songs was going to be the song that we would do, and so there was a great um, great amount of care in choosing our repertoire. So we, we weren't really going um, uh, off uh, out of our comfort zone uh, too far. Let's put it that way. Because I think one of the things that I'm uh, fascinated by is that you have performed in the same event as the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. There, One thing that people don't realise, I suspect, is how closely uh, you, and I suspect specifically Bruce, worked with uh, the great Paul Simon. Sorry, Rob's just ha- copping up a lung here in the background. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. To have those kind of people around you of all the songs that you've that that have been, um, you know, that that you've been close up to, let's call it that way. Is there any of those that you go, you know, what I really wish that had been a seeker song? Uh, yes, there probably are some that we we could have uh, tootled around with. But again, uh, when I say we, um, it would have been one of those situations where we all would have had to agree. And uh, later on in our career, in fact, uh, when we started our 
2013 tour, we we recorded um, uh, the Beatles song "In My Life," and mm. and we also uh, did a proper version of "Silver Threads" and "Golden Needles," and they were they were two that we had kind of left on the back burner, if you like, and so. Uh, that's probably the best example of what you're talking about. But otherwise, uh, the songs that any of us brought to the table, we all had to agree on, and um, that was that was why we ended up with the repertoire we have. There's a beautiful anthem. I'm pretty certain that Bruce Woodley wrote We Are One. I don't know if you had anything to do with that, but that is a song that I would love to have heard the Seekers do, probably at a time... Um, I mean, the... the 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 words of the song and the and the meaning of the song to me would have been really good in the late sixties early seventies. Well, yes, it certainly has become anthemic, and yeah, Bruce Woodley wrote that with uh, with help from Doug Newton from the Bushwhackers, and uh, it has become almost uh, an alternative uh, anthem for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of those one of those songs that, that really means a lot to a lot of people. And I think it, that again, as you said, it crosses crosses lots of um, different uh, borders and uh, it's accepted by, by a huge number of people within Australia. In fact, as it turned out, when we were doing our UK concerts, we included that in our repertoire and it was amazing the number of people, probably the the, the Poms who felt that they, they wanted to be Australian <laughs> because of that song. Because it's, it's almost up there with... Uh, well, not almost up there, it's up there with... Um uh, oh, Peter Allen, what is it? Um, I still call Australia home. Yeah, very much. It's so. that same sort of thing that it's not jingoistic, but it's it's heartfelt. It is very much so. Very much. So. It really gets to the core of people's emotions. I think that particular song, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it's certainly very. It's a highlight of our con- uh, concerts. That's for sure. Uh, just on on creating music, uh, Keith, are you a, a music first, lyric second, or do you go the other way around? How how do your songs come together? It works in either direction for me. Uh, the, the two most recent songs that I've done started off with a, uh, a word phrase and um, the, uh, the, the ones before that started off with music and uh, fit words or an idea, a concept. You know, sometimes it's just a concept. Uh, the one that I'm working on right now actually is called Hudson River Moon and it's a, uh, it's a song that relates to the, the 9-11 issue that, uh, the, that uh, uh, commemorated its uh, 20th anniversary only a couple of weeks ago. So uh, that started off as a, as a concept, and then the, the lyric and everything and the message and everything else followed and the music followed. But, um, uh, but the two most recent ones started off as, as uh, things that people said, and, and that became, uh, those, those became the starting point for new songs. So it varies. We're um, getting close to having to let you go, unfortunately, because we could sit and chat here all day. That's why this show is called Two Blokes Chatting, because we sit here and chat. <laughs> but um, just um, um, before we, we do need to give the uh, the album a, a plug, certainly. But uh, one thing I'm fascinated about is the role of Tom Springfield in the Seekers. We all know of Dusty; yeah. she was pretty handy on the on the voice. But Tom was uh, pretty instrumental in getting you up and about, wasn't he? Oh, he certainly was. He, he uh, we often refer to him as the fifth Seeker because he. He was really a guiding hand behind all those early singles and albums of ours, and we certainly couldn't have done it without him. And, you know, having written songs like I'll Never Find Another You and Georgia Girl and World of Our Own, Carnival's Over, all those things, you know, that they, they were absolute landmarks in our career, and uh, it was his influence. And he's, he's a quiet achiever. He's, he's a very, uh, uh, very behind-the-scenes type uh, operator, and, and he's very happy to be that way. But uh, we again, we keep in touch with him too. He's uh, he's still in our life, and uh, um, we love him dearly, and uh, he loves us uh, as far as I can tell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, because not only because we mentioned uh, your involvement in Eurovision, but also you you were, had an involvement in an Academy Award nomination for one of those songs. Didn't Georgie Girl was an Academy Award nominee. The one, yes, we were pipped at the post by uh, Born Free one that year, and uh, I don't know, uh, we probably. Came second, I think. Anyway, whatever it was, Born Free was the uh, was the winner that year. Yeah, outstanding. Uh, well, very honoured to be to be among that uh, illustrious uh, uh, cohort. Well, between the three of us, uh, there's only one of us that's had any involvement in Academy Award. Although Rob, some of Rob's acting work is uh, is has to be seen to be believed. <laughs> 
Fair comment. In every sense of that phrase. Hey, uh, Keith, before we let you go, uh, and it's just been an absolute thrill to chat to you today, but uh, there is an album out. I think it came out in July on Decca Records. I'm sounding very DJ, aren't I? And uh, it is, well, you can't say it's not descriptive. The album is called Live in the UK by The Seekers, and because it is The Seekers Live in the UK, it is a CD and it's also a DVD, I understand. That's right, yes. The DVD is, is of uh, uh, performances in uh, live performances in the UK, and as I say, we're, we're really lucky to have full houses all the way through, and um, uh, this just... Uh, uh, commemorates and celebrates that, that those those concerts that we did there. And it's, it's our full repertoire. It's the full show with with the banter in between and, and all the rest of it. So uh, you know, people can sit back in their home theatres or in their or watching it on their iPhones or whatever it is, and uh, and hopefully uh, share some of those memories with us. Was it a particular concert that's been recorded, or is it bits and pieces from the series? Uh, bits bits and pieces. Yeah, that, that was that was the way we had to do it, and. Uh, 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 generally, there was uh, we took uh, the obviously you'd take the best parts from from the various pieces. So uh, yeah, it was it was all it was all good. The, but, is... uh, in, in closing, I I, um, I have a particular connection with Geelong. I have to say. Oh yes. Uh, because I was uh, I got to slip this in because I was supposed to be there uh, about a month ago, appearing at the Door Gallery, and uh, had to postpone that because of the dreaded COVID. And we're looking to, uh, this is to do my solo concert, that is, mm-hmm. and uh, looking to postpone that to sometime in uh, February of next year. Well, so Hopefully I'll be uh, in your neck of the woods. Well, please make sure you let us know via your publicist um, how to get, you know, get tickets and stuff, because I know Rob and I will be there knocking on the front door and uh, coming to say good day. but we'll certainly give it a pump up on uh, to the four listeners that we've got on our radio <laughs> station. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll be great, Rob. Uh, Keith, uh, thank you very much for your time. Please pass on our warmest to the other three who have um, had an uh, an incredible impact on our early lives, so many people in Australia, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners this morning will fondly remember the Seekers uh, ringing in their ears all through the uh, 60s, and of course, due to the, the joy of recorded music, many, many years beyond that. Best wishes to you uh, in your future. I love the fact that you're still creating music uh, uh, at the age of 80, which is uh, quite staggering. But uh, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you as well, Neil and Rob, and, and look forward to chatting next year maybe, eh? Look forward to it very much. Thanks, Keith. All the very best. Okay. Bye for now. Bye-bye.